those of you who don't know me, I think Jeremy did a pretty good job of the introduction. Um, but yeah, I co-founded Zuru about 15 years ago now when I was 18, and we've built it into one of the largest toy companies in the world. Uh, over 5,500 staff, 18 offices, about 54 acres in factory space, half of it all automated. Um, but like Jeremy said, I'm not here to talk to you about that today. Um, I'm going to talk about a new business that we're entering, um, which is in the fast-moving consumer goods categories. And I'm going to talk to you about um, how we can create new age disruptive brands in big, stodgy categories. And so what I'm going to do is talk through a number of macro shifts that are happening around the world. There are four key macro shifts that are allowing people or companies to disrupt and reinvigorate established categories. And then I'm going to talk about how there are various companies or people in the US that have built really big data-driven brands and uh, disrupted established categories quickly. And then I'll talk to you about um, we're building about 10 of them, 10 different businesses, but I'll talk to you specifically about Rascal and & Friends. And Rascal & Friends was doing $0 in sales, and in 2017, at the end of 2017, we launched it, and by the end of this year, it'll do about 100 million in sales, maybe 100 million plus, so in a really short amount of time. So I'm going to explain how the framework and those macro changes allows you to build a disruptive brand really quickly and scale it really quickly in an established category. So this was a great quote that I read the other week from George Lehman, who's the founder of 3G. 3G owns Anweiser Bush, Kraft Heinz, Burger King, great company. But he said, I'm a terrified dinosaur. I've been living in this cozy world of old brands, big volumes. You could just focus on being very efficient and you'd be okay. All of a sudden, we're being disrupted in all ways. We bought brands and we thought that they would last forever. Now we have to totally adjust to new demands from clients. So what's happening is traditional categories are being completely upended. And if you look at the S&P 500, big FMCG companies, companies like Unilever, Mars, Nestle, they used to be really safe growth stocks. So people would invest in them because they would generally their returns would grow in line with population growth. But in the last three years, these stocks are all the worst performing stocks on the S&P 500, down on average between 13 and 18 percent. And the reason for that is all of these data-driven brands that are disrupting their categories in big ways. I'm going to talk about each macro shift and how that applies to then creating these disruptive brands. So the first major shift is the rise of social and digital media. So big brands used to be able to lock out challenger brands because of traditional media. They would advertise out here, they'd only capture this much of their audience, but for a challenger brand to come in and reach their audience, it was really tough and the investment was so high. But now, with the rise of social and digital targeted advertising, that's totally changed. You can now build brands far more efficiently than ever before. So, for example, Facebook has up to 29,000 data points on every individual. So when you advertise with targeted ads, take nappies, we're trying to target mums with babies, with, with, with babies, that's a really specific audience. And when we spend on social and digital, it actually takes the first 10% of your spend and optimizes towards people that engage with that ad. It then optimizes to people with those same data points and continues to optimize that ad. So the spend is so efficient and you can reach people for so much less than ever before. So, Mobile advertising is going to raise from 71 billion this year to about 250 billion by 2020. And, and this, this, this shift is huge. Like if you're sitting um, you know, on the moon looking at the world and you're looking at how these big companies have trucked along for the last 50 years, it's been exactly the same model that they've used. Traditional media, big spend, big retail. Um, but like I said, that's all sort of starting to change. So the next major shift, uh, reviews are becoming as relevant as brands. And so this is really important because it used to be, for example, say you were buying a mouse for your laptop. Ten years ago, you'd look at the brand. You'd go, it's Microsoft or it's HP, and you'd trust it. That would give you the validation. Now you might look online and you'll see a mouse. It's a great price. It's got 
20,000 reviews, 4.7 stars. You don't really care about the, the brand. You'll read a few reviews, go, looks great, great price, I'll buy it. So this also plays back into social and digital advertising because you can now reach and talk to your consumer directly as well. So you're getting this instant feedback. So reviews are becoming more relevant than brands. The next major shift is the rise of e-commerce has caused margin erosion in traditional bricks and mortar retail. And so what this means is that retailers are looking for more brand differentiation than ever before. Um, if you look at this graph, for example, this charts a lot of the US major retailers. The only retailer over the last five years that's seen an increase in gross margin is Amazon and Costco, slightly. So that's a big shift as well, because when online and retail have the same brands, and online is pushing prices down, bricks and mortar has to match that pricing and erodes margin for the retailer in the total category. So retailers need to start solving the commercial problems in those categories by expanding margin with brand differentiation. So that's a major shift. <clears throat> the last major shift, and perhaps along with social and digital targeted ads being the most important one, this is probably the second most important, and it's that brands can now be made relevant to new millennial and Gen Z audiences. So millennials and Gen Z are consuming brands and advertising in totally different ways. So 77% of millennials no longer want to buy the same brands as their parents did. They trust brands completely different, and they're more skeptical of bigger brands that have been around forever. And they're more likely to trust smaller brands that they're consuming through their social media networks as well. So it's a really big shift. Um, you know, these um, creating relevance is a subject which is, is it, it can take on many different uh, facets, I guess. So what's relevant today? Things like transparency, things like sustainability, things like building a brand that is driven by purpose as well as profit. So making it relevant is a whole host of things, and I'll go into a few of those when I show you how we're building our different brands and how that resonates. So when I was sort of building the toy company, and I kept looking over and thinking, in toys, it's such a dynamic business, like you're changing, you're working at such pace and designing so many products. We design hundreds of products a year, tool them and make them at scale. We make over 600,000 products a day. And I kept looking over at more stable categories, like FMCG, consumer goods categories, thinking, wow, it would be great to um, have a crack at one of them. And I started looking at these data-driven challenger brands that were popping up in the US. And they were all essentially playing from the same playbook. They were working out how they can make the brand relevant to new audiences, millennials and Gen Z. And then they were really harnessing new age media in terms of targeted, efficient ads. And so brands like Harry's, which has raised over 700 million, it's valued at a few billion now, it, for example, made premium more accessible, and it just used social and digital ads. So they tried to make a really aspirational brand really cool, but they price positioned it a lot less than Gillette um, on the shelf, and then they made it far trendier, and it had this kind of cool edge to it. Halo Top Ice Cream, they looked at how what was becoming relevant to new audience was having healthier treats, healthier um, products, and then they used transparency in terms of their packaging. So they looked at ice cream, and they worked out that people on average consume a tub of ice cream on average over two weeks. With Halo Top, they consume a tub in one sitting, they made it healthier, and then on the front they put 320 calories, like there was this huge transparency around it, and they only used influencer marketing for the first two years. Halo Top last year became the number one pint-selling form of ice cream in North America. It's valued at over $2 billion and only four years in business. Method cleaning products is the same. They said, what? what? The cleaning category is like ugly. You know, most of the products sit below your bench. They said, how do we make products more beautiful? So they sit above your bench. How do we have no nasties into them? How do we use recycled materials that are more sustainable? They worked out how to make the category more relevant to new audiences. This is a great example which shows how making a brand relevant to new audiences can be quite simple. It can take just a really soft innovation. So if you look at the protein bar on the left, this is what RX protein bars started with. Their sales in 2013 were about 600,000, 2015 without packaging, about 2 million. 
In 2017, their sales went to 160 million. The next year, they sold to Kellogg's for about three or 400 million, I think. And all they did was the simple innovation that made their packaging and product more relevant and transparent to their target audience. And so they went from that packaging to that next one. And the, reason, the way they explained it is they used to go to fitness shows selling their protein bars. And they'd say to everyone, you know, our protein bar has three egg whites, two dates, four cashews, and there's no bullshit in it. And they said, why don't we just put that on the packaging? And everyone said it looked ugly. But they did that, they changed that packaging, their business exploded, and they sold it after only four years. And so it's a really great example of how to, uh, a small innovation can make your brand or product more relevant uh, in this day and age. So at Zuru Edge, and we started this at the end of 2017, we're effectively building uh, 10 different businesses in 10 different categories. And we're looking at each and saying, what's big, big, stodgy category, and how do we reinvigorate it and make it relevant to those new audiences? Then how do we harness paid, targeted social and digital advertising to hit that segmented audience and drive 365-day marketing plans? Um, by 365-day marketing plans, I'll go into that with Rascal and Friends. So Rascal and Friends, I was um, sort of trying to look at these data-driven brands in the US and going, wow, they're growing to multi-billion dollar valuations in a matter of years. They're just like exploding. And I was trying to work out why, and I was kind of working out this model. And a friend of mine, Grant, who's here today as well, had been working with his sister on developing a nappy. And we met up in Bali for a holiday, and he was showing me this product. I didn't know the first thing about nappies. But he was explaining how his sister, Louise, has four sons, and she wanted to, or she'd been working on designing this really great uh, nappy that was better than anything on the market, and I was like, how am I to know what's a good nappy? But he kept telling me it was really good. And the more I started to look at the product, the more I started to realize that we could make it tick all of these boxes and we could scale it really, really, really quickly. And so I'm going to explain how effectively we used each, um, each macro changed, build a model that allowed us to grow the business extremely fast. I mean, to build a business, we launched in September of 2017, and Grant just told me uh, before, even in New Zealand Australia, we're a year and a half in, we're doing about $700,000 a week, but we've launched all around the world this year, so we just launched with Tesco's yesterday, Walmart, uh, a couple of months ago, and it launches in about 24 markets this year. Um, so the first one is, of course, making brands relevant to new audiences. So when I saw the product, and Grant also explained to me, he said, look at Huggies, you know, Procter & Gamble, uh, Pampers, and Kimberly Clark's Huggies. You know, they're both still really old and stodgy. They still use, like, Eeyore and Mickey the Mouse and all these old-school kind of licenses on their packaging. The packaging's still, like, those bright fluoro colors. It's not really relevant to new, like, millennial mums. And I started to look at it, and it had been designed in a way that was really social and media-friendly, like a really cute, edgy design, almost fashionable. But also, there were no nasties in it, no formaldehyde, chlorine, latex, um, fragrance, or, or lotions. And we were using sustainable materials with sustainable pulp. So it started to tick all the boxes in terms of you know, how it could be made relevant to new millennial audiences. And... <clears throat> You know, and part of remaining relevant is also we've got to continue moving forward. I know we'll ship over 700 million nappies this year globally, but we need to keep looking at how we continue to make the brand relevant going forward. And obviously, to remain relevant, the rise of the socially conscious consumer is really important as well. And so, you know, it's clear that the environment and sustainability and making a better product is just going to become more and more important. So we continue to work on lots of iterations now of trying to build a fully biodegra biodegradable diaper, um, which is really tough to do to also maintain it, its function, uh, essentially, as well. But that's a big part of our future, to remaining relevant to even future, future generations, where this will become even more important um, again as well. Um, <laughs> the next one is, of course, reviews. And so to get great reviews, you have to make a truly great product. No exception, period. That's the most important thing. Because you can drive people to trial with targeted ads and advertising and efficient advertising, but if the product's not sticky, you'll never grow anything. 
And with Rascals, uh, Louise and, and Grant truly designed a phenomenal product and we get tens of thousands of incredible reviews. I know probably a, a number of you in this room have already told me you're using Rascals and how good they are. And the product is truly amazing and it's the reason even we just heard yesterday from Coles in Australia that Rascals was their best product launch in 20 years, um, success-wise. And a big part of the reason for that is the product is truly great. And so you can't go into any of these categories or do anything unless your product is truly great. And Rascals, we get incredible reviews everywhere. And you know there are basically nine core innovations that we built um, within the product that makes it better than even the $10 billion Pampers brand and $9 billion Huggies brand. And so parents rave about it and they end up talking to other uh, parents and other mums. So in order to get great reviews, you've got to create a great product. And reviews are so, so, so important now. Even a lot of our targeted advertising pulls out the reviews and we use those as actually advertising out to, to other mums. And um, of course, the next part of the equation was how do we harness new age targeted media around rascals? And that was the easy part because we've created a very kind of fashionable looking diaper, very edgy compared to anything else that was in the market. And so the great thing about targeted advertising is it's so incredibly um, efficient. And so a couple of examples here, for example, if you have a really engaged audience, we can spend, you can see on that right hand column, $50 and we can target mums and we can reach over almost 100,000 of them. We can get 10,500 comments, like we drive so much engagement. And we use data around the ads, so we're always throwing ads against the wall every single day and we're looking at which ones resonate and then we spend more behind those ads. If the ad doesn't resonate, we pull back and we try another one and another one and another one. So you're actually using real-time data to work out which ads work and which ads don't work. And it's such an efficient way to do things. And if you get content as well that really resonates with your consumer, sometimes you don't have to spend anything at all. We put some ads up last week with Walmart Canada and I think we reached over half a million mums and we spent zero because it completely resonated and then we got mums tagging other mums and the organic reach and it just went viral and that was with content that resonated. So that's amazing. You couldn't do that six years ago. You have to spend a million dollars to reach that many people with traditional media. So that's a huge, 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 huge change. I can't explain how big a change that is and it's part of the reason that these big FMCG companies are not playing catch up necessarily but they're acquiring a lot of these new data driven brands um, to try and be in this space. The other thing you can do of course is with social and digital advertising now, you can geo-target, which is incredibly powerful. So for example, this was a palette that was on uh, promotion at a pack and save in Hastings, and Chris Quinn, the CEO of Foodstuff, sent me the image, and we just put it up. We said, Rascals are on special. We spent 50 bucks. We targeted mums around that store to tell them that Rascals were on special promotion, and it was put on Saturday night on the 14th of April, and we were already selling more than the other brands because we were on promotion at the front of the store. But our sales went from, in that one store on that one day, the next day went from $1,300 to almost $5,000 um, in that one store on one day, just from targeting mums that tagged other mums saying, wow, it's on promotion, get down to pack and save and buy it. So that's an incredible shift, right? Again, compared to what you could have done uh, years earlier. Um, and then, of course, the last part of, or the last macro shift was, of course, the margin erosion for major retailers and retailers needing brand differentiation more than ever, ever before to protect their margin. And so if you're trying to go into new international markets, you're trying to launch with retailers, don't just go on with a blanket approach. Think about your commercial model. Think about the pain points for the retailers. 11 FMCG companies dominate about 85% of the world's consumer packaged goods. What that means is, generally speaking, they don't always deliver a lot of margin. So think about different models. Think about how you create brand differentiation. Think about how you drive market share to certain partnerships. Think about how you drive margin in categories where they're not making much margin at the moment. If you can go in and solve the commercial problems for your retailers in these categories, then you're going a long way to creating success and growing something really fast. So we've essentially harnessed those four big macro shifts to build rascals really fast, and it's incredible how well it's working. In New Zealand and foodstuffs, we've taken almost 30% market share in just over a year in a category that was dominated by treasures and huggies, you know, brands that have been around forever. 
And so if you build something that resonates with a new audience, if you make it relevant to that new audience, if you reinvigorate the category, if you look at your marketing in terms of create, using new age, efficient marketing, if you look at how millennials uh, and Gen Z are consuming brands and consuming advertising and you move with that, and if you create commercial models that are disruptive and different to solve your partner's commercial problems, then you can build brands really fast, really quickly. But you've got to think about every kind of facet um, in order to do that and tick all the boxes. So we're really excited about the category. We think we can build $5 billion brands in five years. And so that's kind of our goal at this stage. Thank you. Uh, amazing story. Um, remember, you were at our place and uh, there were some nappies there and you started kind of like, what are these? What, what, what are you buying these for? And there was some exotic brand. I've learned a whole new language around Sweden nappies. I've something. learned what a Poonami is and a, yeah, lots of <laughs> <things>. <laughs> But it was interesting because you said, oh, the bands are no good. And sure enough, that night there was a bit of a brown stain up the back. So I thought, right, we'll try this product. And what happens is I've noticed myself as a consumer going into different stores because you're quite selective about distribution. And the countdown on Waiheke, you can't get it, but you can get it somewhere else. So is one of your, are you selective around distribution? And there's something interesting about your model because you're sticking it through wholesale, big old-fashioned wholesale stores. Yeah, so I like to combine the model. I don't particularly like the new model from a lot of these brands. For example, Dollar Shave, where they're, B2C, business to consumer, especially in consumer goods, because you've got huge retailers there selling billions of products a day at scale. And if you're going to go and sell one product direct to a consumer without having that, you might as well use that existing scale that's there, create a great product, work on your manufacturing, target your specific audience and drive traffic to that large scale retailer. We don't want to concentrate on essentially selling individual product to individual customers because uh, you know, the scale's not there. So we can run these models really lean. And it's the same with our toy business. Effectively, we created a whole disruptive model in that we don't hold inventory. We manufacture to order. We have no wholesale domestic inventory in any country in the world. We work in 120 countries, every major retailer, but we don't hold a single piece of inventory. And we run it all the way back from our factories, which are completely automated. Um, so we basically, from granules of plastic to finished toy to final consumer, it's like a really seamless, streamlined uh, business, which is the reason we're like the third or fourth most profitable toy company in the world. We run a really specific model, I guess. And so we're doing the same here. Do you cast a broad net? Do you work with a lot of retailers or are you very selective? Yeah, we try and, we try and think about the commercial model in terms of how you know, you're going into categories that already have big established players in them. So you've got to create reasons for retailers to want to partner with you. And so we often look at how we can create a commercial model that solves particular retailers' problems. And we go on there and we form a partnership. And we help solve those problems, drive foot traffic, drive margin in the category, and drive relevance for that retailer as well. Because it's really important that these retailers remain relevant. And a lot of them, you know, I'm working at a, a, a CEO level with most of these big retailers and actually, you know, almost, I wouldn't say teaching them, I mean, they know about it, but sort of sharing my experiences as well in terms of how everything's shifting um, so quickly. And you see brands like Halo Top, I mean, it's come out of nowhere, right? It's worth two or three billion dollars in, you know, four years. And so it can really happen fast if you get it right. So all these ads that you're creating and testing, how, how do you create them? Do you just like coming up with lots of ideas and seeing what sticks or do you use a whole agency or have you got a... No, we don't like agencies. We do it all in-house, so we've built like a really great team uh, of talent and then we just brainstorm effectively, add ideas, and we're always testing different ads, different content, seeing how it resonates, spending behind it, targeting people, moving money where it's working, shifting away from where it's not working, and you just keep optimising effectively. So the ads are optimising themselves because the first 10% of an ad spend goes towards finding people that engage with that ad, looking at their data points and going, okay, let's find more people with those similar data points. And that's how the AI with an ads works now. And it's advanced so much even at Facebook in the last three, four years um, that it's so effective now. Um, and so we just keep testing ads, testing ads, testing ads, testing ads. And you can build brands. It's incredible how efficiently you can do it now compared to in the past. And the conventional way of doing that is to then link the traffic that you're acquiring to your own D2C model to drive it to your own site or something and, and convert the sale. But how are you connecting 
the traffic and the interest and the uh, the social media activity of these mothers in particular, how are you connecting that to Napier, Pack and Save, or, or specific, how are you actually driving we traffic? Call, we call out to in our ads where to go and get it, and our whole purpose and the reason about reviews are becoming more relevant than brands, you've got to create a great product that's super, super sticky once people use it once, so the whole purpose of the ads for us is to drive trial. As soon as we drive trial, we know we win the mum. As soon as we won that mum, we know we win 10 other mums because she tells 10 other mums and it just, it's a snowball effect. And so the reason we can overtake, I know on Foodstuffs it took us eight weeks to overtake Treasures, which is a brand that's been in the market, I think, 45 years. I think we overtook them in that amount of time. And the reason is that momentum, that flywheel of momentum. So drive the trial, create a sticky product, and then it kind of takes care of itself and then just keep driving trial. You know a lot about manufacturing, and you've got amazing automated manufacturing in China. So with these 10 new brands, or how many there are, are you frantically running around building <laughs> new factories, or do you find factories, or how do you actually, how do you get, create a back end? Because you're very clear about the front end. Yeah, very clear. How do you get the stuff made? So it's a combination. In our toy business, we have what we call two distinct prongs. One is innovation driven and our innovation-driven sort of trend lines, we outsource most of the manufacturing because there's no point investing in designing all the automation like we do for lines that are going to be here one year, gone the next. But in our evergreen categories, so dart blasters, we shipped 40 million dart blasters last year. All of our dart blasters are made with robots, start to finish. Granules of plastic, finished dart blaster, 50 parts, made with no people. Um, whereas Hasbro, the Nerf brand, still handmade on production lines. Um, Max Bricks, uh, you know, a um, bunch of balloons, bunch of balloons here. We build all these automated factories because they're going to be here forever, these product lines. And so on the FMCG business, our plan, or at least with Rascals, we teamed up with a factory first in, in China, but we effectively, we sourced all the components and materials. The so sustainable pulp comes from the US, the SAP, the absorbency materials from Japan, the elastics from um, Heinkel in Germany. We use 3M tapes. So we're kind of assembling there, and then we've formed a joint venture with our factory. So we're investing in basically putting in a lot more ship machines and capacity um, as we continue to grow. And then on pet food, we've actually teamed up with a factory, I haven't told you we're doing that, but on our new brand, with a factory in um, America existing and factories in Thailand, but we've actually built out all our own production lines. So we've built all our own packing lines, all our own automated lines, and they've given us space in their factories to put in our own lines. So we just installed, as of yesterday, four, four production lines. So it's kind of a combination, and as I think we get brands and businesses working, then we'll do what we did in toys, which is we'll build more and more factory space. I mean, we have 54 acres of factory space. It's a lot, and we just keep growing it. So we can just go into them as they're evergreen and build out our own, our own factories. We've got huge proficiency with it um, on our back end. So it's kind of a combination at the moment in, in terms of how we're doing it. I, 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 I think reviews are so important to validate the brand now right. as well. But my point is when you're trying to start from zero, like so we it's actually in, we similar to the concept of you don't buy, you know, kind of the sponsorship, you get the internal advocacy. Is this kind of a similar actual process to kind of Vans followers? Yeah, the advocacy there? advocates the brand, right? But when you're starting from zero and you're trying to go in and disrupt a category, you need reviews to kind of like get you there, right? Now the advocacy that says the brand's great. So the brand is really important, but I'm saying the review is becoming as powerful as a brand. I think it's 80% of people now will look at a review online before they necessarily buy a particular product. So I think that those reviews and making a great product is really, really important now because there's nowhere to hide, right? And you're talking directly to your consumers now, you're getting instant feedback every day based on ads and you know what they write to you. So it's really different maybe than what it was like years ago. Yeah. And the penny really dropped for me because I was uh, buying some of the nappies after we tried them and it's all we use now. And just going back to a supermarket and seeing the traditional nappy brands, they all look the same. They look really old-fashioned. And then Rascal and Friends, it just looks totally different and fresh. Yeah. So I think you know, it's interesting when, you, when you're so clear about how do you be different and fresh and you put so much thought into the business model, that simple act of preference... Simple, has to be simple. You can yeah. kind of feel it and, and uh, I experience think, I it. I think that commercial model is, is, is super important, but actually having 
the pillars of your business and deciding what is it that makes your brand now relevant to these new audiences and sticking to those pillars through everything you do, your comms, your marketing, your product on shelf, like I think those pillars and staying true to them are really important. Yeah, awesome. Nick, thanks so much. No worries. Cheers, Thank man. You.